Tim Leary is having an autograph party right now in Freeborn Hall, if you're interested in that. Right now, Mr. Freighter Albertus is going to speak from Por Porcelsus Re Paracelsus Research Society, talking how alchemy, alchemy will enrich your life. I'd like to introduce to you a man who's done a lot of work in a field that's fairly unknown, even though you hear a lot of talk about it these days, which is called alchemy. Uh, he'll talk a little bit on a modern approach to alchemy, and then if you have any questions, uh, please, I have some paper, you can write them down, he'll read them off and answer whatever questions you have. I'd like to introduce this time Frater Albertus, who'd like to uh, speak with you. When I was asked to come here, and when I arrived this morning and saw what was going on, I changed my mind. At first I thought perhaps that uh, it being on a campus here that you would expect me to read the paper to you, but I decided I'd rather talk to you about alchemy and make this a little bit more informal. Now first of all, you may wonder what we mean when we talk about alchemy. If you take the dictionary or any book, usually the first thing we hear about it is uh, making gold. Now, I'm not going to talk about making gold. I'm going to talk about alchemy, per se. Well, then we will have to ask ourselves, what is alchemy, or what does alchemy mean? Well, if we go far back, in history, we will find this word alchemy, but prior to it, the Egyptians also had a word for it, and so did the Greeks. And in Greek, we would speak of something like spagyric, which means something to separate and then put together again. Spao, to separate, and agairo, to put together. And so, uh, we have then this word alchemy. When we go back to the medieval times, we have now the stigma attached to it, gold making. So then, what is really alchemy? Well, if you were to use the Latin word for it, evolution, or evolution, well, we're talking about the same thing. So it is not what the dictionary tells us that uh, Alchemy is but a forerunner of our present-day chemistry. It is not. Alchemy, as far as the ancients understood it, and as it is understood today, refers to evolution per se. In other words, it is the process that goes on within nature. And we see that uh, all the time. Because we're talking here about a transmutation and this transmutation goes on before our eyes continuously. Now, if a thing goes on in nature, then we do know that this can also be done artificially. Now, when we say artificially, we mean we take recourse then to artifacts. But we're still working with natural uh, substances. Well, let's put it this way. What nature does may require in some instances thousands, perhaps even millions of years. If we know the laws involved, the same thing can be done in the laboratory and we can come up with the same results. But please bear in mind, we're not talking here about an imitation. And that reminds me, when I walked along here and I saw some of these beautiful crystals that they have here, they sparkle like diamonds and so on. They're not diamonds. Compared to a diamond, that would be an imitation. However, when we talk now about uh, present-day alchemy, that means we should be able to do the same thing nature does in a comparatively short time, and it would not be an imitation. And so we have to make a difference now between a reproduction and an imitation. If we can reproduce, again produce, in a different way what nature does, well, then we have a reproduction. It's not an imitation. Now, there is something, though, whereby in our present-day chemistry somewhat deviates from it. You may recall we talk about an 
alchemist, or if we leave the prefix al off, we have a chemist, just like we have nowadays. But here we're dealing only with one particular aspect of science, or in other words, the field wherein we find the knowledge. Now in this case, we're dealing here strictly with uh, organisms that we can find in either the plant world, the animal world, or the mineral world, where we analyze these things, and as soon as a chemist has analyzed what is to be found within it, well then his job ends unless he's trying to synthesize it and come up then in a synthetic way with what nature produces. However, the so-called alchemists of the former times, they had something which we uh, are very little acquainted with because they had an axiom and said that everything which nature produces consists of three essentials and they used some archaic names for it and they called it sulfur, salt and mercury but at the same time as they represented some tangible physical evidence in any substance we find in the plant, animal or mineral world they said they are also synonymous to three so-called intangibles in other words they based everything upon the law of polarity the old alchemist said if anything exists on a tangible plane of awareness, the same thing will also have to exist on an immaterial plane. And so, when they spoke about sulfur, they mentioned at the same time also soul. When they spoke then of uh, mercury, then they were referring to spirit. And when they spoke of soul, they were referring then to a body. Now all these things that are tangible, they said, have a coexistence according to the law of polarity on the intangible plane. And this is really where the whole difference comes in as far as present day scientific endeavors are concerned. Uh, let's go back for just a moment to clarify what is here at stake and the issue thereof. Now when we speak about soul and we speak about spirit and we speak about body, we immediately enter uh, into a field which we may consider not to be scientific because it's very unlikely that a scientist would uh, talk about soul or spirit. And yet, from a strictly scientific point of view, the alchemists were absolutely right when they said that these three essentials which they said are to be found within everything which nature produces. Now that's very important. Because if you go back to it, they said everything which nature produces consists of three essentials. And as we just said, they named it sulfur, salt, and mercury, which were again synonymous to soul, spirit, and body. Now these three, they said, will always be found within four. And these four, the old alchemists called now the four elements. Now we're not talking about... Uh, what we call elements today, which are but atomic components. What they were referring to when they spoke of four elements, they mentioned fire, they mentioned earth, and water, and air as an element. Now we know from a strictly scientific point of view, uh, this is irrational. But let's pause for a moment and look at it and find out whether it is really that irrational. Actually, when the old alchemists spoke about fire, they were not talking about any combustible matter or anything. To them, anything that was of a thermal nature or was emitting heat came under this classification, fire. So they classified anything that was emitting heat to the element fire. When they were speaking of the element water, they were not referring to water per se as we have at H2O, but to them anything of a liquid nature was classified as belonging to the element water. So when they spoke of the element air, they were not just referring to the air we breathe, and yet again they were, because what is contained within the air, as we know, it's all of a gaseous nature. We're not just talking about the nitrogen, the hydrogen, whether we talk about rhodon, xenon, or any of the other gases we find in there, when the element air was mentioned, they were referring to anything and everything of a gaseous nature. And so then, 
that went also for the element water. So anything of a liquid nature was referred to the element water. So we see that it has really nothing to do with our present day over 100 elements that we have. Well, we do know they couldn't be elements because Originally, it was considered that an element cannot be separated again. We know what Rutherford did and so on. I mean, you know it all from your textbooks. So uh, there is no such thing as an element which cannot be uh, divided or separated anymore because we know the atomic structure thereof. Now, the alchemists of the Middle Ages already, they were aware of these things because they were able already to split the atom. Now, they didn't use cyclotrons or anything of this uh, very sophisticated... Uh, uh, well, ways and means that are available to us, yet it was possible for them to do that because when they spoke of a transmutation, that means going to the core of an atom and uh, uh, trying to uh, uh, bring about a mutation, a transmutation, so it's not just the changing of the atomic shells, uh, the electrons, I mean, pardon me, uh, they had to go right down to the core. And it's the very same thing that we're trying to do now, and yet they claimed, and it needs only further substantiation and verification, whether they could actually accomplish it. So they were not just, as the books tell us, primarily interested in changing the base of metals into gold, which they claimed they could do. It needs only, again, like we said, the, uh, further substantiation and verification. Now we do know it can be done. But the life expectancy, even if you were to transmute mercury into gold, is very short and so on. It reverts back again into mercury. But that was not their primary, uh, their uh, main idea. They were primarily concerned about finding ways and means whereby a change can be brought about in a lawful way and manner, where under identical conditions, identical results would manifest. And so then they proceeded and said, if this is the case, well then even a man being the highest evolved species now in the animal world as they considered it, they said if that is possible, well then even these baser tendencies within a human being can likewise be transmuted. But here we were dealing then with the intangible. When we speak of emotions and like we say of our thoughts, they're not tangibles, but we do know they're subject to change. And so they said, if this is possible, let's try it and find out if it can be done on the physical plane, where we have the evidence at hand. In other words, proceed in a scientific manner. And so they tried it with the plant world, and they tried it also with lesser species in the animal world, and they tried it also with minerals and metals. And according to the records available to us, however truthful and uh, reliable they are, they said it can be done. Now, I have been intrigued with this now for, for cent uh, not centuries, I beg your pardon. Uh, we're talking about our time now. For decades, and um, it's been my life's work to find out if there is really something to this or if this just is, uh, well, a bunch of nonsense. And so, uh, I'm happy to state that... Um, through consistent research in the laboratory and otherwise, uh, it has been established that such things can actually, to this very day, and we have proof thereof, it can be accomplished. Now some of them have been rather far-fetched and uh, have not yet, as yet, been um, reproduced uh, in such a manner as they said, but nevertheless we have come up with such results where literally if these things that uh, they said could be done can be done. Now let me give you a little example thereof. When they said that everything which nature produces consists of these three essentials, well that means then whatever nature produces, that is before man interferes with it, he must be able to separate these three essentials without adding anything foreign to its nature to it. So if a plant or whatever it is a mineral that we would work with does not consist um, of any alkalis or any acids, so we cannot use any acids or alkalines or bases in order to uh, decompose them or separate them rather. 
Now, this is, uh, of course, now pretty difficult, but it can be done, and it is being done. And so, uh, let me explain, or make an attempt at least, to explain a little bit more in detail what they were aiming at. So when they spoke of sulfur, salt, and mercury, whenever they referred to sulfur, they said whether it's in the plant world, whether it's in the animal world, or whether it's in the mineral world, this sulfur will always represent an oleum, in other words, a hydrocarbon. When they were speaking about spirit, or mercury as they called it, they were talking about it literally, the spirit. Now here is where the trouble comes in. When we use this word spirit, as soon as we open up the dictionary again, we get into this uh, theological, philosophical interpretation. But that's not what they meant. When they were talking about spirit, uh, the, the word spirit to them meant life. So anything which nature produces is imbued with life. And if he can free now that spirit or that life from a substance, that is what they meant by mercury. And so in the plant world, it's literally spirit. Or if we were to use this Arabic word for it, alcohol, or alcohol as we call it now, then it would be, if we were to take some grapes, well, we would have then the spirits of the grape, or as it is then fermented, of course, into wine, the spirits of wine. That's the life in it. And that's the energy in it. And those of you who ever imbibed some of these spirits, well, they know whether they got any energy in it or not. And so that is what they were referring to when they were talking about spirit. So it was life that they were talking about. And that can be found in any substance which nature produces. So you can get the spirit of Melissa, you can get it out of wine or what have you got, and we're talking about spirit. Now, by the same token, such spirit is an intangible thing and yet it has to be found in a corporal enclosure and we just gave you the name for it so they called it alcohol because a cohol a cool is something very subtle but that's the body so if we were to take now some alcohol we're talking only about the body wherein this spirit is to be found because they associated spirit also with the element fire. No wonder the Indian called it what? Ice water, right? Now, of course not. The Indian called it what? Fire water, because there was this fire in there, this spirit. Now, that is completely different again than if you can get uh, out of a plant, for instance, by steam distillation, it's uh, essential or ethereal oil. Now, this hydrocarbon they referred to as sulfur. So when they were talking about sulfur, they were not talking about brimstone or the sulfur that we are acquainted with. And that was just a, a, a name to indicate, but it was never intended to have the exact meaning. And the reason for it is now, if you were to go back again uh, several centuries, you will find out people were not allowed to uh, think and speak as freely as we are permitted to do today. There were political and ecclesiastical hierarchies that practically told people what to think, what they could do and not do. And so they developed even their own um, uh, ways of communication, in fact, even their own language by way of symbols, similar like we use them in, in chemistry and in physics today. To us, again, they are archaic symbols, but they are not uh, irrational or silly any more than the ones we use in physics or in chemistry. The reason they had to use these symbols was they were advanced thinkers. Now, bear in mind, those people that were called alchemists in former times, they were way ahead of their times. And they were so far ahead that they could not dare to reveal these things uh, because of the prevailing circumstances where they were told, like we said, uh, what could be said openly or what could be taught in the universities as long as it didn't go against established doctrines. And so they came up then with their own language, these uh, symbols or these alchemistical symbols as we know them, and it was just as we use them today, like I say, in chemistry or physics, whereby they communicated. Now, as soon as some of them found out what they meant, they made slight alterations again. It was a matter of protecting themselves. 
because they figured a living scientist is worth more to the world than one in a dungeon or his, you know, his head cut off. And that is the reason, actually, why they had these uh, secret symbols, as they called them. Actually, they are not any more secret to those initiated in it than in the symbols that we have. I just pointed out again and again in chemistry or physics today. Now, without the knowledge and understanding of these symbols, it is, of course, impossible to get into this world of an alchemist. So, to think or to find out what these people meant and what they described and said it can be done, the first thing we'll have to do is, is learn to think as an alchemist did. Now, at first glance, we will immediately meet an opposition because if we think in terms of a chemist, there's a clash. Because here we're talking strictly science, whereas an alchemist in this case, he was a philosopher at the same time. Well, he also was a scientist. Because he found out that whatever he could get hold of and what nature revealed unto him was only possible by way of the, that degree of intelligence which was found within him. And he realized now that there must be a source which was superior than the intelligence uh, that he as an alchemist would possess, or even collectively, if there were more of them. And so they tried to find this source again. And this had to go beyond creed and dogma. Like nowadays, when you kids now, you are more liberal in your way of thinking, you're not this clamped down anymore like that, we have a broader concept of it. In other words, it all boiled down to one thing that they said, there is an intelligence superior than I, you, or we collectively possess. That is a very rational thing to come up with. And so they said, when I look at myself, you see, this is now where the alchemist really begins, when he begins with his own self, to set his own house in order. And then he found out he had to be absolutely honest with whatever he undertakes now in this search to find out how nature works, what these laws are that are immutable in nature. They repeat themselves whether man is here on this earth or not. And so they found out that if he is not honest, completely honest within himself, it is next to impossible to enter into that realm which makes it possible that nature could unfold and show and reveal these laws which nature uses to bring about all that what we see. And so he had to free himself from creed, from dogmas and whatever it was. So when he finally came to that conclusion that he in all sincerity could say that there is a superior intelligence. Now, I don't know what it is, what it looks like and all that, but there is one. And so he got hold of himself and he had one primary question that confronted him perhaps more than any of them. And in fact, to this very day, it hasn't changed. People still ask themselves this question, where do I come from? Why am I here? And where will I be hereafter? Now, all this belongs to alchemy, because this is this evolutionary process. Now, in all honesty, they said, if I have to answer this question, then I'll have to say, I don't know where I came from. I may believe it. There may be certain creeds and dogmas, and people tell me I've been born before, and I will be born again, and all that. But then they had to come up with the answer and say, I don't know, because I do not recall where I have been before. All right, now some of you may come, oh, well, I had some in your own famous words and some spiritual experiences and uh, a former reincarnation. I've been this and that and what have you got. And by the time we were to put them all together, then history is rotten because then there wouldn't have been only one Napoleon, there wouldn't have been one Cleopatra because everybody's been a Napoleon and a Cleopatra and what have you got. But this is all make-believe. In all honesty, can you say that you do know where you come from before you appeared here on this earth. Now, if you are as honest as these alchemists were, well, then you will have to say, no, I don't know. Now, if we were to ask you the next question, why are you here? 
Now, anybody of you can answer this question knowing, not because somebody else told them that or you'll make it up, but you have the evidence, you know why you are here. All right, if you have that answer, you're way ahead of me. Now, and it's the next one that's open, where will I be hereafter? How do you know you're here? So they said, if you want to enter into this realm of alchemy, where in nature now is supposedly to reveal the laws involved, where all that which is taking place does take place, that requires that you're absolutely honest with yourself. And that's the hardest thing for people to do. And that's the reason why we got so many alchemists. Because it's much easier for people to talk it themselves into things and out of things than to see them as they are. There's always this daydreaming, this wishful thinking, and all these hallucinations that go with it. And yet, strange as it is, when people go into astrology and then they go, you know, in the metaphysics, and then you talk about the Kabbalah and the Tarus and the good grief, what have you got, and all that, there is a sign there that people are trying to fathom that but they can't put their finger on. But they sense it, it is there. Because out of the three negative answers that in all sincerity we would have given, I don't know where I come from, I don't know why I'm here, I don't know where I will be hereafter, one answer came out of that in the affirmative. And that is, I know that I am here. I don't know yet why I am here, but I do know that I am here. And so if I've gone that far now, I have at least something, at one thing to go by. Now I have to find out why I am, I mean, that I am here, I find out now. Are there any tokens or anything available? Is there anything available that could help me to find out why I am here? And so they searched and looked around, and they found an answer. They found an answer as to this why. Now, we can't go into all of these things right now in detail, but nevertheless, that is what they claimed. And further research and so on has substantiated it to a great deal, that there is an answer that can be found why we're here. Now, let's go back again. This is the honesty that they said is the first thing which is required if you wanted to delve into these things or do any of this research, which is again a searching, again, research into that which is available but for some reason has been lost or been uh, covered up or whatever it may have been. All right, now then, when we talk about alchemy in this present tense, we're talking about evolution. Now man evolves, but we have to find out about man himself. That's the most important thing in this evolutionary or alchemistical process. So then, if man likewise consists of these three essentials, well, we have to find out then what is meant by soul, what is meant by spirit, and what is meant by body as far as man is concerned. So the alchemist says, if you cannot make a clear-cut definition between soul, spirit, and body, or if you were to use these archaic names, sulfur, salt, and mercury, you cannot enter into this realm of alchemy. You can only then go in any of the subdivisions, like we said, chemistry, physics, mineralogy, botany. But alchemy is encompassing all of this. So an alchemist is not just a chemist or a botanist. And so in order to get uh, involved in this whole thing, it is required that man will have to find out about himself. So this trinity or this triune being which man represents has to be found. Now here we enter into a really a, a very difficult category because we're walking the razor's edge so to speak because on the one side we have the scientific physical evidence and on the other side we have the philosophical, the religious, metaphysical or whatever you want to call it. Well then, let us take then this word soul. Now, I suggest the following. If you would like to get uh, a clear definition, go and see whatever your religious denomination or affiliation may be. Go and ask your rabbi, your priest, your reverend, your uh, lodge master, or I don't know, who, whatever it is that you belong to or is, are associated with. Now, ask them this question. In all sincerity, in all honesty, would you please give me a very concise, clear definition Wherein is the difference between soul and spirit? And uh, 
you're starting something. Because, and I can speak from experience, that's always the troubles we've had, there are always a thousand and one excuses, references to books and holy books and what have you got, and then it turns out that the two are intermixed. There is no dividing line where the one is completely separate from the other. Now, why should that be? Here, we're talking about uh, lost souls and evil spirits and all kinds of things, right? And if we do not even know what we're talking about, how in all the world can we do some research on it if we don't know what we're talking about? Now, if you were to take Webster's Dictionary, which is the official one in your campus here, which even holds up in court, and you were to read in there what it says, what soul is, well, now it was, I don't know whether it's Mr. Webster or anybody thereafter. Anyway, it's official. And they come up with what? They mix the whole thing up. And at one time, soul is spirit, and spirit becomes soul. So you go and turn to spirit in the dictionary, and what do you find? It mixes it up again, and spirit and soul. And this is the last and the final word, isn't it? Well, then, where is this difference? Now, the alchemists... They were very precise in making such definitions. So when they said, there is a difference between soul and spirit, and it can be proven on the tangible plane, like when they took a plant, without addition of anything foreign to its nature, they could come up with these three, in itself, physical, separate entities. The same thing can be done with the animal body, and it can be done in the mineral world. Now, there's no problem in the plant world, there is no scientific problems. There is no problem in the animal world, scientific, but rather, as soon as we come to the mineral world, we're getting into trouble. Now, if we take sulfur, as they said, to be an oleous substance or an oil, like we can get an ethereal oil, you know, out of plant extractions, so we can, of course, get it also from an animal. We know if you've got enough of this blubber around you, it doesn't take long to separate that. You can even separate an oil from the fatty substance, so we know it's there. But when we talk in oil, we talk hydrocarbon. As soon as we come to the mineral world, now we're getting into trouble. And why? Because the mineral and the metal, we're talking, or gems as they belong to the mineral world, we're talking here about inorganic substances. Now, how can a hydrocarbon be inorganic when it contains carbon. Now that's a big problem. Now, let me relate a little incident that actually happened. One of our uh, co-workers in our home laboratories were located in Salt Lake City. He was a graduate uh, of Caltech. And at that time, um, President Dubridge was the president uh, of Caltech. Well, it so happened that they had the, the 75th anniversary, which was a few years back, and uh, we had a special invitation to attend some lectures there of Gelman and all the other capacities, as you noted, were there. And so um, uh, one of our researchers, and he asked uh, Dr. Dubridge, for instance, uh, what would you say um, if we were to take a, a metal and extract from it uh, what the old alchemists called the sulfur on oil. He says, oh, come on, and calling him by name, he was an alumni. And he says, you know very well, science has now for hundreds of years it, uh, worked with the atom. It's ridiculous, and you know you work with impurities. Of course, now this is always the easy way out. You say you work with impurities. But he says, now look, I'm working with the chap there in Salt Lake City, and we've been doing it. And he says, oh, come on, you can't tell me that. You can't do that. It cannot be done. Well, whatever it is now, but the results are there. It can be done. Now, is it then a hydrocarbon or isn't it? It would be ridiculous because if you talk about an inorganic substance, how can you? Well, we had a government inspector come at one time and he took a sample of it. In fact, we got some out of zinc and we gave it to him. And I said, now look, even if you send it into Washington and get it to the head chemist, I can tell you right there and then, although I don't like to tell people anything, but this time I used the word I tell you. Usually I say I suggest. As is, he will come and tell you that this is a fanciful term because there is no such thing as oil of zinc. And you know what happened? A few weeks after we got the report back from the inspector, 
and he gave us the exact copy as it came from the Bureau of Standards in Washington. And believe it or not, he used the exact words that I gave him. Oil of zinc is a fanciful term. It does not exist. And so he gave us an analysis down to the neutrino of all the hydrocarbons and whatnot that consisted, that this substance consisted of. Now, I know we all say this is ridiculous, this cannot be. And so, anyway, they analyzed the substance which did not exist, gave us the exact analysis on it, and said, of course, well, you must have used as an extraction media, then some oils or what have you got. Now, bear in mind, no oil or any oily substance was used in the extraction of this substance which turned out to be just that. So here again, we have proven that what the old alchemist said can be done. It needs much more research. We haven't arrived yet at the end, but we're on the right track. And so when we look now at it from a contemporary point of view and we talk about alchemy, uh, we should not laugh off what the old ones said, even to the point when they came and said that they've been able to take a base of metal and transmute it into a more refined one. Now just because we have not as yet been able to do that uh, and on such a scale as they claim they did it, well nevertheless it doesn't exclude it that it cannot be done. One would not be a scientist if he would come right from the very beginning and says no it can't be done. And not, let me give you here not, not a little illustration of it. You know, the old alchemists, they were talking about this uh, thing called potable gold. In other words, gold that you can drink, it is not harmful. Of course, there's no problem. You can dissolve gold. Any of our region will do that, or you can get other acids. And we do know in extreme arthritic conditions, the salts of gold are being given. But then they're the salts of gold. This would refer again to the body that they are talking of, the mineral. Now we know that's toxic because the level can only be tolerated, you know, to a certain extent. And then it settles out, it's heavy like mercury, and you die of gold, or mercury poison if it was mercury. Okay, now they said, you can take gold and extract from gold an essence, just like you would out of a, say, of a plant. Well, up to now we say this, is, this can't be done. But there is proof on hand that it can be done. Again, by using an extraction media which is not foreign to the substance you work with. Now let me explain, I'll make an attempt to explain this a little bit. Uh, we do know an alcohol will dissolve a resin, and either will dissolve an oil and so on, and the water make a tincture. And so this so-called spirit of the alchemists in the uh, plant world is, as we know now, the alcohol. But it's not alcohol per se. That's only the vehicle we're in, it's to be found. If you touch alcohol, you don't burn your fingers. But there's fire in it, right? All you have to do is ignite it, and if you have pure alcohol, it'll burn. You don't even have to do that. If you were to get this alcohol in contact with something within you, because this is life, spirit is life, as they said, you will immediately feel this reaction. Because again, in the animal world, where life is to be found, is again a vehicle. And that is known as blood. But blood in itself is not life. But it contains the life. We know very well, when we have a person die, it still has blood in it. But that which is found within the blood, or the life thereof, this energy, that's gone. And so, throughout the plant world, this vehicle is alcohol. Now we have various types and kinds of alcohol, you know, the amyl, butyl, ethyl, and whatnot, but they're all alcohols, and in there you'll find the life. Now we have warm and cold blood, we've got different types of blood, as we say, but it's again within the blood where this life force is to be found, and as soon as that leaves it, all you have left is the vehicle or the blood. So if you were to take a corpse, you can get the blood out, but try and infuse this into a living person, see what's going to happen. So you know very well, you wouldn't get a blood infusion, a transfusion, excuse me, from a, a dead person. All that dead is good for is fertilizer, as to take it out by the barrel in the mortuary when they pump it out of the corpse. If it was of any other value, well, then you wouldn't have to have any blood mangs. There are enough people dying, but there's no use for it. Why? Because the very essence that is needed is lacking in the blood. 
And so it's the same. If you had the alcohol and you were to take this essence or this life, the fire out, you haven't got anything left of virtue. Now when we come to the mineral world, there again, wherein this spirit is to be found, there is a name which is rather unknown. Uh, in general terms, it's rather unknown. So it's not called alcohol. It is not known as the sanguine or the blood, as we say. It has another Arabic word, and it goes under the name of al or al as the old alchemists called it. Now, there again, there are various types of al So if you can get now the life, as the alchemists claim, we're still with them, as they claim, you can get this life, this essence, also out of a mineral or out of a gem or out of a metal. And that, of course, is much more powerful than what you can find within an animal or within a plant. And the reason is because they have been subjected to this infusion of this life essence. This is universal. It's like the breath of life that comes in for hundreds and thousands of years, whereas in a plant cycle, we speak of a year or maybe a centuries if you wanted to, if you talk about the sequoias, these redwood trees and so on. And the same with an animal. An animal is subjected again, or man in this case, is subjected again only to a lifespan. Let's say, all right, he may be a hundred or more years old. But when we talk now about anything in the mineral world, here we're talking to a, a such an influence that extends itself over hundreds, thousands, if we're talking even millions of years. So the enormous energy, or this spirit, which is live, as we said, which is to be found within there, when that can be released, is enormous. Now we know that, fortunately, now if I would have spoken to you 50 years ago, we would not have had the evidence that we've got now. Because when we talk now about this enormous energy which is to be found within the mineral realm, if we can harness that, if we can control it, we're talking about something, this is so fantastic right now, that uh, the mere attempts that have been made up to this point are cons could be considered insignificant, although they are significant in so far. Now, think of it, about the atomic energy when it is being released. Think of the atom bomb. What happens? What does an atom bomb consist of? All right, two pounds of peppermint herb, right? Two ounces of comfrey, three ounces of tallow, isn't it? And then some meat in it? Of course not. It's taken from where? From the heaviest element that we've got, that again needed to be separated. And so, even in a good handful thereof, there is so much of this energy to be found. If we can control it as we release it, we know what it did. The first one that was released in Alamogordo, not to talk about these terrible things in Hiroshima, Nagasaki, and so on, where they were used destructively. But we're talking about a fact that we cannot deny, that in there this energy is to be found. And it reveals itself again. By what? by what the alchemists call the element fire, or this enormous thermal emission, the heat thereof. Now, if we can harness this energy in the mineral, metallic, or metallic world, mineral world, including the gems and so on, well, then, if we can control it, we have to learn first to control also this emission that we have within us. It's just like an atomic absorption and atomic emission thereafter. And so the alchemist said, if we cannot set our own house in order first and find out about our own self before we endanger our lives and blow ourselves to bits, we will have to find out what makes us tick. And so their main objective was not, like we said, to free the enormous um, uh, amounts of energy uh, that we find in the mineral world, but if you can turn these things down in such a way and bring about a rearrangement of the atomic structure, yes, you bring about then a transmutation. But they said the most important transmutation has to take place within man first. Unfortunately, man knows very little about himself. He knows more about the, from the textbooks what other people have said, what he believes. But as far as he himself is concerned, he knows very little about himself. 
He wonders at times why at one day he can go and feel so happy and embrace the whole world, only the next hour turn around and kick everybody in the shin. Now why? Is he subject then to... There's a gap here as the physical recording tape had to be flipped over in the recorder. Stay tuned. Three essential sulfur, salt, and mercury, or soul, spirit, and body. Like we say, the elements and the atoms, and it goes out into space and whatnot. And he is actually running away from himself. He doesn't know enough about himself. And so he said, what we have to do now is, as we got evidence from the uh, plant world on the one side, we have evidence on the other side from the mineral world, man now standing in between. He will have to learn now, after he has some evidence, as we said respectively from the other two worlds, what's actually going on within him. And so here again we will find that everything which nature produces, as they said, consists of these three essentials, sulfur, salt, and mercury, or soul, spirit, and body. Well, they said, let's get acquainted with these things. And so we're coming back what I asked you a little while ago. You asked your rabbi, reverend, or whoever it is, to give you a very clear definition. What is the difference between soul and spirit? And you're getting yourself and him in trouble. Because all they can do is just fall back on books, and then the holy book, this one, or whichever one it may be, says, and so on, or in my opinion, it's this and that. But where is it? Big pardon? I asked, they years ago, well, I, now I don't know what you're talking about. I have to keep my feet on the ground when I go into these things. I cannot allow myself to drift away in the clouds with all kinds of things I have no substantiation for. You see, when we talk about alchemy, let's not lose sight of that. We're talking about science in an even more so advanced manner. Because we're not talking about science per se only, we're taking the philosophical side also into consideration. Because you are a dual being. You're not just a being of flesh and blood that has various organs. Because you know your body is being animated. That's the intangible of it. Now if I were to go around with the head and say, here, put me a handful of your thoughts in there, what would you see? They're intangible, and yet they're there. But if I were to say, put your hand in there, well, then this is tangible. So we're primarily more so concerned about the tangible things in our daily life. It's only when it begins to hurt and we have no more answer for it. You know, anything bad happens or tragic happens. Then all of a sudden, then we realize there's something else we just can't make out, we can't understand, despite all the things we know, all the degrees we know that we may hold, all the evidence we have on the physical side, and yet we're talking about that which is intangible, whether we call it now psychic, emotional, or whatever you want to do. They call it, I mean. So, here we are. If we cannot have this clear-cut definition, what is the difference between soul and spirit and body, we cannot enter into this realm and come up with strict scientific evidence. Now, when we talk about that, which relates to the inner, it's scientific. It's the end you have to know. Now, we do know that we think, that we're animated, that we act. This is strictly a scientific fact. But we know very little about it. Now, we know about the energy that we have within us, or this thing we call life. But we know very little about it, because at one time, man, we can, you know, uproot a tree, and the next time we can barely lift our leg, or it's hurting here, or this, this and that. Pooped out, pardon my friends, uh, all, what? Low on energy. And so, we're trying to recoup this energy, and what do we do? We go again to the physical aspect. We're swallowing some pills, or it's got to be a special herb, and it's got to be this and that, in order to get the energy. And where do we get the energy from again? So we go right back primarily to the plant world, right? We go right back to the plant world because what do we do? We want to get all the fruits and all the vegetables that are rotten and that are dead, right? That's the one that you buy and pick when you go in your grocery store when you buy things. Of course not. You want to have the fruit that is fresh, ripe, alive. Why does a farmer not eat a chicken or a cow that has died in his barn. If he can kill it and cut off and retard 
this energy from going out and holding on to, he will eat it. But if the chicken or the cow or the calf or whatever it is or the pig has died, he won't eat it. Why? This energy has gone out of it. He has no use for it. And so if we deprive ourselves now of this energy that we find in our daily intake or the food, well then we're depriving ourselves of this energy. And that is when we are low on energy or at other times we feel like it. But that pertains again, we're talking here now about life, this energy within this thing we call the body. Thank you. Yes. So we come to the third thing and that is what now? This thing called soul. And what does it turn out to be? We have a body. This body now is energized or is alive. Okay, we have then the mercury or the spirit. We have the body or the soul. Now what would the sulfur be? Well, all this needs to be coordinated within the body. And now we may call it by various names, consciousness, mind, or what have you got. Now mind is not life or spirit, and neither is mind or soul body. So by the time we have finally come to this very exact definition that we have these three, then we may begin. But if we cannot distinguish it, if we still talk about spiritual things and so on, and we actually refer to things of our mind, we don't know what we're talking about. Because we're talking then things of a mental nature. Now I have some questions here. i got only a few minutes left here. It is well known in the field of the occult that alchemists have many lifetimes to complete their work. What methods of transmutation and transmutation could you suggest besides down-to-earth psychotherapy? Well, it would take me uh, half as long again, and I just killed the time here with you to go into that. Uh, I may have to say just a word after I read this next question here, because i got only a few minutes left here. They just gave me the slip. And the next one says here, uh, referring to atoms, how did they... Uh, overcome the power of the nucleus. It's several times stronger than gravity. All right, you see, here we're talking now about things that cannot be answered in a few minutes. I took nearly an hour just to give you a... What, what did I give you? An idea of what we could get involved in when we talk about these things. Now, may I add this to it here as far as these questions go? Uh, now, please bear in mind, I haven't got anything to sell. I'm not trying to buy anything from you or anything of this thing. I've just been asked to come here and to speak to you. That's all. Now, in, uh, there is the uh, Paracelsus Research Society. Uh, this is named after this great man, Paracelsus, who lived about a half a thousand years ago and who was so far ahead of his time and still is ahead of us in many aspects that this society was named after. Now, this society has its seat in, the, in Salt Lake City. It is a non-profit educational institution. It's recognized by the government and so on. And it teaches. And all what it does is teach this research as it pertains to these alchemistical concepts. There is, let me point this out right away, it is not a society in this sense that you call it a brotherhood, a church, or a, a club, or what have you got. It's an educational institution, there is no membership available, and uh, those who eventually will find their way then to such a place, they can be instructed there. In uh, this research that has been conducted now over many, many years, and so on. There is, and these teachings are being given, I'm, please, I'm not making here any advertisements or anything. I'm just trying to state some facts as they are. And these teachings are being given freely to those who eventually, when this time comes in their life, uh, that they will find such a way and such a place and so on, uh, without any remuneration. In other words, there is no tuition or anything. But uh, at the same time, there are no uh, lessons sent by mail or whatever you call these things, correspondence courses and so on. It can only be, uh, there are uh, two weeks courses and uh, dormitories are provided then. And those who are accepted, like we say, uh, it is free, but uh, they will have to find their own way when the time comes. 
But this Paracelsus Research Society, like I pointed out, is not affiliated with any mundane organization whatsoever. There is no membership available. For those who are interested in it, well then, uh, you have some people here that you could contact. Don't come and see me. See these people here, they can give you the information. So I'm sorry, my time is up. There would be much more to be said, but I'll have to quit now. Thank you very much for your attention. Now, let's go into Wellman Hall to hear the conclusion of Frater Albertus' talk. We have someone for your listening enjoyment and education and information who is an alchemist. His name's Frater Albertus. Uh, he'd be happy to answer questions that you might have, and he'd also like to tell you a little bit about alchemy or spergeic medicine. It's also called iatrochemistry. Been around for quite a while. Paracelsus, uh, you might hear a lot about at different times. He did a lot of work. So, without further ado, um, Fred or Albertus will say a few words, talk a little bit. If you have any questions, uh, don't be embarrassed to ask if they do whatever they do, transmute metals or uh, live forever, or whatever rumor you may or may not have heard. Fred or Albertus. I just got through speaking outdoors and. Uh, I don't know whether it is uh, the thing to do to repeat what has been said already or whether we should continue up on it. But for those who uh, are not acquainted with what I'd like to speak upon, namely this word alchemy, perhaps it is uh, appropriate to say a few words on that particular item first. Now when we speak of alchemy, we immediately uh, half the word as it is uh, given in the dictionary and uh, it is related to making gold, the gold makers of old. Now the question immediately arises, is this possible? Have those who claim that they could make gold, uh, can it be substantiated? Is that all there is to what is known as alchemy? The answer is, of course, no, it's not. Alchemy is not the forerunner of our present-day chemistry, as it is generally believed. Alchemy, it turns out, is but another word. It is of an Arabic uh, origin and refers to evolution. So when we speak of alchemy, we speak of evolution. Now, this evolutionary process, as was pointed out outdoors, extends itself throughout nature. That means whatever goes on within nature, whatever we observe, is strictly an alchemical process. The only difference where we come in now is where we are trying by way of alchemistical research or this evolutionary research is to try and duplicate what nature is doing in uh, less time but just as efficiently. And so then, as we pointed out outdoors also, we have to make a distinction between an imitation and a reproduction. So if we imitate something, that is of course not what the original uh, would represent. So if we would have an imitation emerald, well, it would be an imitation emerald. But if we are in a position to come up with an emerald the way nature produces it, then it is not an imitation. It is genuine. The only difference is it has not been produced in the bowels of the earth, but it has been produced in the laboratory. And so here we go. When we talk about alchemy, we should bear in mind we're not talking only about the forerunner of our present-day chemistry. There is a certain allure to it when we think of what in medieval times these so-called alchemists were able to come up with. They made various claims what they could do in the plant world, what they could do in the animal world or in the mineral world. Some of these claims have been substantiated. Others are still waiting further verification. However, 
when we talk about test tube babies and things like that, which seem to be very revolutionary to us nowadays, the alchemists said they could do that already. When they took minerals or metals of an inferior nature, they said they could refine them and change their whole atomic structure. So at first glance it seems impossible. But then when we look into it, and as we then say, do further research, we will be appalled by the evidence that is available to us if we would only know what these former alchemists were talking about. Now let's take an example. As we pointed out, if we talk about things of an imitation, which is not a reproduction, reproducing again what nature can do, well then, it will have to withstand scientific investigation. And if such scientific investigation it cannot prove what the alchemists claim that they accomplished, well then we have no ground to stand on. On the other hand, if it can be, well then an entirely new field will open up that we may not have considered up to now. Some of the terms that have been used and are presently being used in alchemy uh, may seem absurd to us. They are of an archaic nature, so when we hear things like sulfur, salt, and mercury, of course we realize that we're not talking about common brimstone or the table salt that we have or mercury like we find in the thermometer. What they meant was that we're dealing here with substances which are to be found within nature where these names have been given to indicate but it was never intended that we should understand thereby that when they speak of sulfur that it was common brimstone, common sulfur, or mercury, like quicksilver and so on. So what is to be understood thereby? They said it refers also to man because these three words are also synonymous in the evolution of man. Namely, they refer to soul, to spirit, and body. And so they said, what man needs to do is, is first of all to find out about himself, what he is trying to find out in the plant world or in the mineral world, where he knows so much about it from a scientific point of view, but knows very little about his own self. So the alchemy, or this evolutionary process, as we prefer to call it, is not dealing just with organisms that are tangible, that can be seen, but it also deals with those very things that are of an intangible nature. So when we speak now of soul, or when we speak of spirit, we would have to know, of course, what is meant thereby. In the alchemistical language, these names, as we pointed out, indicate. But if we do not know what they indicate, we cannot make any sense out of it. And that is the problem that all those phase that enter now into these studies as they pertain to alchemy. Again, we have to reiterate, when we talk about alchemy, we're not talking about chemistry of former years. We're talking here about something that concerns the entire evolutionary process within nature. And the one which concerns us most is our own self. And if we cannot find out about our own self, or at least as much as we have found out already about other substances that we come in contact with in our daily lives, well then it behooves us now to do something very drastic and begin with the alchemy of the individual. Now, according to the alchemistical concept, everything which nature produces consists of three essentials. And as we pointed out, the archaic words sulfur, salt, and mercury are actually synonymous to soul, to spirit, and to body. Now, man is such a triune being. But if he cannot find out what this actually is that he is composed of, or that he consists of, then, of course, it is very difficult for man to find himself. And one of the most important things for man to do is to find out about himself. 
Strange as it may seem, he knows so much about science, and that is, of course, the knowledge as it pertains, like we say, to all the organic and inorganic substances we come in contact with. And it not only appears to be that way, because appearances can be deceptive, but it is a fact that he actually knows more about things outside of himself than he does know about himself and what goes on within himself. So if we approach now the alchemy from such a point of view, we will realize that man has to find out about the three essentials within him. And if he cannot do that, well then, he cannot enter into this realm of alchemy. So what needs to be done? Well, first of all, if we find out that the body of man, as one of the three essentials within alchemy, does not function properly, that is, if you find disease, if you find illness, if you find lack of energy, or whatever we call these things now, we will have to find out what causes it. If we are listless, if our mind is not active anymore, as it should be, we forget things, and so on. Well, here again, we enter into the alchemy or in this evolutionary process. So we will have to question ourselves, what seems to be the matter here? What needs to be done? Without this concept that we speak of, this alchemistical concept, where all three are being taken into consideration, uh, we cannot set our own house in order. The first of all, just like in a chemical analysis, we have to begin with the self-analysis and we have to be able to distinguish between these three essentials within us, as we pointed out, which is known as the soul or the spirit and the body. Now again, I have to emphasize what was said outdoors. If we are not in a position to make a clear-cut distinction between soul and spirit, we are not in a position to do anything as far as this body is concerned because these three form one and so here again it is impossible for anyone to enter into the realm of alchemy if we do not have a sufficient grounding of what these three essentials are uh, uh, meaning to us now in everyday life, we find out that the, uh, uh, the main concern of man is his health. Any malfunctions that we find within the body are due to one or all three, or at least two out of the three, being out of order. So, centuries ago, attempts were made to find out what can be done to set this body into order so that the mind can function properly and enough energy can be found within the body. Various remedies have been found, as we know, that have been recorded. We find them in the various materia medicas. And then they have been used in order to restore the bodily functions, to restore the energy and the alertness of the mind. And most of these things were found in the plant world. In fact, up to a few years ago, before what is now known as chemotherapy came into being, most of our medications were uh, derived from the plant world. Now, whether we use now the allopathic approach, the homeopathic or whatever naturopathic and other systems and therapeutics we may use, we have found that these uh, remedies in order to restore again the malfunctions within us were derived from the plant world. Now, as far as the alchemistical approach is concerned, the preparation of such medications differs now entirely from anything that we are using today. Now, it does not mean that these preparations have not formally been made in what is now known as the alchemistical way. Now, here is wherein they would differ. The old alchemists, when they prepared, for instance, a herbal substance, they went about it completely different than we do. Now, as you know, you can go to a herb store or to a health store and you can get yourself some herbs. And then, according to the uh, 
available evidence, certain herbs are working on certain organs and do the various things. And so you make yourself a tea from it. In other words, you're trying to extract the essentials from an herb. But however, according to this alchemistical concept, everything which nature produces consists now of three essentials. And if you were to take now an herbal substance and you were to get only that out which enlivens you, or the spirit thereof, as we would say, or the essence, well, then you would only get one out of three. In other words, what is now known as the mineral uh, is left aside, unless there are some minerals which are water-soluble in it that you take out of your herbal essence. On the other hand, on the other hand there is also something else to be found within it, and that is an essential oil. Each herb has an essential oil within it, which can be freed by way of steam distillation or otherwise. So if you cannot get all the three that you find within an herbal substance combined, instead of taking them separate, you do not get the full value that is to be found as a healing agent within herbs. So you may take an essential oil as we find it. You may want to take some oil of peppermint or oil of melissa or what have you got. This would be but one of the three essentials. You may take the essence in form of a tincture, as you would in the form of a tea and so on. You would get a minute amount of this oil in there, which otherwise is left alone. And as soon as you have extracted it, what you call the residue or the tea leaves, you throw away. And in there you'll find again the mineral or the salt, the essential part thereof. So if you do not have all three, then you get an immediate lift, as we would say, from this herbal substance. But strangely, after a while, you are just about where you were before. Now what would you do, for instance, if you were to cook some, uh, some vegetables, let's say, and you were to... Uh, cook, let's say, some carrots. And after your carrots are done, then you move the lid over from the pot, you go over your drain board, your sink, and then you pour the water off. So actually what you're pouring away is the very essence of it that you would otherwise try to get out of a tea. And yet, where well, you would throw the tea leaves away, here you eat now the carrots where all the essence in the life has been taken out. And then, of course, you realize that the very essence that you need, you could not find. So you go to the health store and you drink some carrot juice. Now, you'll pay again extra for it, what you could have had before, because the very essence that you needed, you poured away. And so, likewise, you may be in lack of minerals. Now, whether it's potassium or the calciums or whatever it is that you find now in your vegetables, well, then they likewise have gone in solution, those that are water-soluble. Well you pour them down the drain. And so you go where? You go again to the health store and you buy some minerals. And so we see that our whole approach, when we talk now about nutrition or about the, the essentials that we need to keep us going, we're going about in a very irrational way. Now, the old alchemists knew that and they said, so whenever you eat or when you prepare a medication, which is to help you to restore any of the disorders that you may find in your body, all these three essentials would have to be found within it. Now it is a sad story that nowhere in the United States, in the entire United States, to the best of my knowledge, is there anything available where you can get either an allopathic, a homeopathic, or what other therapeutic systems you have, any medication that has all three constituents in it after they've been separated and purified and put together again. We either have a tincture, as we say, and they become more so rare all the time because what is being dispensed, and that goes for allopathic as well as homeopathic one, is in form of a powder or a pill as we get it nowadays. In other words, the minerals that we find thereof. But the essence that is the life within it that we find also by way of its oiliness that is adhering to it we do not find now fortunately in Europe there are still some that manufacture some medications 
And I repeat again, for either the allopathic or the homeopathic or naturopathic way, where these three essentials are to be found. Unfortunately, like we said, uh, we do not know up to now of anyone that, that manufactures them in the United States. And the reason for it is that the alchemistic approach whereby these things can be separated, purified, and put together again without adding anything foreign to it, which does not belong to these herbs or plants, is to be had. Now, uh, just lately, uh, we have become acquainted with one such uh, uh, pharmaceutical plant that is manufacturing these things in the United States now. And according to this alchemistic concept thereof, and as these people here who have here, this booth here can tell you now, where it goes under the name of Paralab, which is an abbreviation for Paracelsus Laboratories, and those of you who listen to what I had to say outside, uh, that refers to this uh, great man Paracelsus, who uh, lived about a half a thousand years ago and who's been a genius, uh, who gave us actually homeopathy before even Hahnemann appeared on the scene and who gave us chemotherapy, which is just a comparatively new thing, where these three essentials which nature provides in everything which it brings forth can be found. And so then, anyone now who is concerned about its own self, more so than the scientific endeavors we make to find out what the atomic structures of other things are, should now put more emphasis on his own self, or this three human being, as we say, his body, that which animates his body, and that which enlivens his body. So if he is lacking energy, he will have to find the plants, or the herbs, or whatever it is, which will make it possible for him to restore this energy. As we know, energy cannot be lost, but it can be diminished within us, and then it just goes somewhere else where it's being soaked up. And so this goes also for this thing, what we call in our consciousness or our mind. If our mind gets weak, and as we say, we cannot remember things anymore as good, or we cannot absorb them anymore as we should, well, there again, there's something wrong in the household of this whole body wherein the mind functions, which needs again that whereby these things can be provided with. But if we do not know how to get them, if we do not know where to find them, well, then, we just can do what we did before, depend on others, and get these things piecemeal. Take a few minerals here, take a tincture of this, sniff something of that, or what have you got, in the hope that we can coordinate again this body wherein the three essentials are out of order. And so, we are entering now, in this new age, actually also, upon a completely different way whereby such medications will have to be prepared. We'll have to get away from this one-sidedness and try to coordinate ourselves, that is the body, our mind, and that which enlivens our body in such a way that we will become a balanced triune unit again. Now, this uh, a pharmaceutical firm that we found out that does that and produces now these... Uh, uh, herbal medications and also from the mineral world is known as Paralab, as we said. And if you wish any information, you can go to this booth right here where you can get some literature to that extent. Yes. All right, the question was what do we think of ginseng extract? Now we do know ginseng does not grow only in Korea. We have it also grow naturally, it grows in the eastern part in, the, in Pennsylvania. The, uh, it's only then the American, not the Korean or the Chinese ginseng. Uh, the American Indians were aware of it. Uh, it is a most wonderful uh, plant. It has many virtues in it. But here again, if you get only the extract thereof, we again do not have the full value of the plant. If it cannot be, as it is known, spiritually extracted or in the alchemistical way, you still would not get all three. And that is the reason why these things have to be taken over and over again. Because as soon as the energy vanishes within us, well, then we have to replenish it again. 
But when we get all three essentials in it, they work in an enzymatic act, or like the enzymes within us, which continuously reproduce themselves. And once we can get that going, we have no need of continuous medications because by way of our diet, if we eat the proper food and we get what this body requires, well then the enzymes naturally within us will work. All the medications we take, no matter from where they come, are only a stimulus to get us going again. Yes. So the abstract is only one part of the other part of the mineral. We just said, the minerals that are left behind, that we find within the residue or the feces thereof, and the powdered root. If you take the extract from, well, then just like you pour your, your carrot water away and you eat only the, the, the carrots, well, then here you take the extract of ginseng, but all the minerals that go with it, you don't get. And from that, besides, an oil can be made out of ginseng that would have to be separated and purified so that the pure extract, the pure oil of ginseng, and all the minerals of ginseng, when they are being put together again, then you would have such a spiritual or alchemistical uh, medication. All are in there. And we do not have that nowadays. No manufacturer that we know of is producing any such medications nowadays except this firm in Utah there where we find this Paralab. There you can get literally the spituric medications. Um, you would have to find out there uh, if somebody would want ginseng, well, they order it and wanted it spiturically prepared for them, they get it. Yes. And that goes for any of the others too. But the information that you wish, you would have to go to this booth and they can give you the uh, information. Yes. Uh, to what? Well, we just pointed it out. Well, whether it's this company or not, then you would have to learn how to prepare it yourself. No, 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 no. It is not quite that simple. They would have to be separated into its essentials. Oh yes, you have to separate each one of them, then purify them and get all that which is, there's still some slight toxins always connected with it, it has to be removed. Again, without putting anything foreign to this plant. No acids or any of the other chemicals. Yes, but this has to be done now in a strictly pharmaceutical way. Right. You need the, what the essentials within the root, where you find the minerals in it. And you would need that. Right. And you, no, not, you see, you have to get this again out of, the, there's very little from the leaves, it is the root of ginseng that you get. Anybody who gives you anything else but the, the essence to be taken from the root, well, you, you wouldn't get the thing. See, in some plants it's in the flower, in some plants it's in the leaves, not it's in the root, in the rhizomes. The proper thing is to do to take the entire plant. It take the entire plant, especially at the time when it is in bloom, uh, when it's in blossom, and that would take, again, several years for a plant to mature again. So this information you can get over there. Well, I had hoped to uh, stress some other topics on it, but I don't think there's sufficient interest in that. So uh, if there are no further questions, are there any other questions that anyone has? Well, then, uh, uh, I think I have added to what I did not say outdoors uh, here now. Thank you very much. United Earth Fund is a 501c3 nonprofit organization founded in 1977. United Earth News is UEF's news and educational initiative. We do not accept funding from advertising, underwriting, or government agencies. We rely on contributions from our viewers and listeners like you to do our work. If possible, please do your part today and support United Earth Fund. Go to the Donations and Membership page and give generously if you can. Thanks.